glad you made it. In this video, I'm going to be skirting the law because I want to reactivate some of these 1980s beepers and pages. I'm going to have to transmit some radio signals. I've been learning about radio with my Hack RF software defined radio, receiving various types of radio signals. This is the sort of thing that's banned in Canada. First, I'm going to start with these beepers. There's no display on these. The only thing they can do is beep and flash this red LED. Time and space. These limitations affect us all. How can you conserve precious time and expand your working space? With an Edmonton Telephones beeper. An inexpensive way to keep in touch for important calls and messages while you're away from home or office. If you're needed, you'll know instantly. And no one needs to know where you are. This was the simplest sort of pager you could get. If you wanted to contact someone, you'd leave a voicemail or a message with an operator. And then the person with the pager would have to find a phone and call to hear the voicemail or the message. It's probably been 30 years since these were last used to receive a signal. I've had them for a long time and I'm really keen to get them working again. To do this, I'm going to need two things. I need the frequency that they're tuned into and I need their unique ID code that they've been programmed with. This is also known as a CAP code or Channel Access Protocol Code. And you can bet I'm also going to be taking them apart because I want to see what's inside. These are called beepers or pages. These terms can be used interchangeably. Technically, beepers have been around since the 1950s. What the devil's that? That's me. My office calling. That deal on the Hawkins property must have come through. You mean they dialed it? Yeah, I've got my own personal number. Excuse me, I'll call in. Hey, let me see that. Sure. <laughs> How about that? What do they think of next? Over time, they became more and more popular, and by the 1970s, citywide networks began appearing. I'm starting with this Motorola beeper. It takes a single AA battery. Turning it on gives a demonstration of its beeps. There's also a red LED that flashes. You can press down on the switch to mute the beeps at any time. Now it does mention on the back that its frequency is 148.6375 MHz. But without a cap code, there's not going to be very much I can do with it. So it's time to take it apart. Very easy with a single screw, the whole thing slides apart. And wow, look at that. It's a completely through-hole board. This looks like some very early 80s electronics. In fact, it looks a little bit like a standard FM radio. And in many ways it is. But it must include some digital electronics to decode the packets it's receiving. And I can't even tell which components would be doing that. There is a label here with a six-digit number on it. This could be the cap code. Cap codes are normally seven digits, with the first digit being a zero or a one, because there are only about two million possible cap codes. I'll make a note of this number before I put it back together. The other beeper I have here is this smaller NEC. Apart from being smaller, it's almost identical. It works in exactly the same way as the Motorola, with the switch and the muting and the red LED, except this takes a triple A battery instead. It also lists a model number, R3T4-6A. Inside the battery compartment is something very interesting. There are two numbers in here. One of them is an eight digit number, but the other one is seven digits with a leading zero. This could actually be a cap code, but there's no frequency printed anywhere on this. That means it's time to take this apart. And the disassembly is identical to the Motorola. A single screw in the bottom and the cover slides off. But the insides look very different. It's all surface mount electronics. It looks a lot more like a late 1980s design to me. It's a dual sided board with one side looks very radio related and the other side looks like it handles all the digital processing with these chips. I'm going to take a guess that this 8 pin Oki chip might even be the EEPROM that holds the cap code. But for the moment the radio side is more interesting because there's a crystal here, and printed on it is 148.037. This could actually be the frequency that this pager is tuned to. So it's time to bust out my HackRF and see what these can do. 
I have a HackRF with the extra porter pack option attached. This includes a screen for a full portable experience. This is all made from open source hardware. So you have to be sure that the hardware revision you're getting is compatible with the latest open source firmware. This firmware includes a POXAG transmitter. I've set the frequency of this Motorola and I'm putting in the cap code from the number I found inside. I tried transmitting with different board rates and different options, but I'm getting no response. I think that number may not be the cap code that's programmed into this pager. Switching to the NEC, I'm going to input the frequency I found inside on the crystal, 148.0375. And for the cap code, I'm putting in 0308750. All I need to do now is activate the transmitter and... There it goes, it works. I finally managed to get one of these pages working again. This is so awesome. I'm using a transmitter power on the HackRF of about 1 milliwatt. I've tested the range and I can get about 10 to 15 meters away before the signal's too weak for the pager. This means I can run as many experiments as I need while still staying under the radar of what's legally possible. Unless someone's within about 15 meters of me, they're not gonna know what I'm doing here. By the late 1970s, a European pager standard was developed called POXAG. This helped make pages compatible between different equipment to help with development of city-wide networks. POXAG stands for Post Office Code Standardization Advisory Group. It seems odd that the post office was involved in telecommunication standards, but up until the 1970s, it was common practice in many countries for the post office to run the telecommunications networks. The heyday of this technology was really the 1980s and 1990s. And thanks to the POXAG standard, this is when display pages began appearing that could show messages on a small screen. It's a pocket-sized pager where your messages are actually written down electronically. You don't even need to get to a phone. Well, they're not around yet, but this is how the system will work. The person who wants to send you the message first phones up a control centre. And an operator there keys it into a computer. The very first ones were numeric display pages. This was used to send someone a phone number on their pager, but was also used to send numbers that had some sort of meaning attached to them. This LA Times article, for example, describes teenagers and some of the numbers they were using as meaningful messages. An entire culture developed around using numbers to represent messages. I've had a look at some of the long lists of some of these numbers, and I'm not really sure how widely known many of these were, though. Even though this Motorola pager looks like it's one of the very first numeric pages, I think it's probably actually one of the later model alphanumeric. I'm not completely certain though because the display just doesn't work on this. But I do have a number of these alphanumeric pages from the 1980s. I've been really keen for a very long time to get these working. The one I want to get working most of all is this really nice big screen NEC pager. It can display four lines of text and just a very simple menu system for protecting messages so they don't get overwritten by new messages, deleting messages and setting the time. This model also has an electroluminescent backlight, but it's so dim I can barely see it. And the only way I can show it is to take a long exposure, but trust me, it doesn't look this bright in real life. There must be a light sensor because it only comes on in complete darkness. OK, to get this working, I just need the frequency and cap code. And right on the back here, we can see there is a frequency, 148.1875 MHz. And right underneath it is code 06003. Breaking out the HackRF and attempting to send a page to this, and we get no result. We get nothing. So I am going to open this up and have a look inside. I really like how easy and modular these are inside. There's a nice big fat custom NEC chip on the board. I'm going to guess this is a microcontroller doing all the CPU functions. There's also a crystal here which has 148.187 and this confirms the frequency that's printed on the back. I'm also quite interested in what's under this sticker on this chip. 
It's made by Toshiba, and from the way it looks, I think this could be a RAM chip. Being an alphanumeric pager, this would need a lot of RAM to store all the messages it receives. I'm also pleased that this just happens to match the brand on the battery that I'm using. I'm going to take this as a good omen. A critical part of this pager for me are these pins right here. I was able to find a couple of web pages that describes what these pins are used for and how to program these pages. I'm going to need to build a connector. I found this row of spring contacts and it just happens to have the exact same pitch as the pins on the pager. With some extremely careful soldering, I was able to make this very dodgy looking connector. After reassembling the pager, it does seem to fit okay, and hopefully the pins are contacting. These web pages also describe some ancient MS-DOS software that can be used for programming these pages. And with a bit of searching, I was able to find a copy. I just need a laptop and now I can get started. Introducing my GPD Win 1. This is the OG of GPD's Windows-based laptops. I got this second hand, but it does run Windows 10 and should do exactly what I need. To interface to the pager, I'm going to use a USB to TTL serial adapter. I love these things, and I've used them several times now when interfacing to old hardware. On the laptop, I'm running DOSBox. I've made sure to configure the serial port to pass through from DOSBox to the serial USB that I'm using. This is a fantastic way of using old MS-DOS software that needs a serial port. Now I just need to run the NEC programming software. And the first thing it asks is which ROM do I want to use? The model on the back of this pager is R3A4-11A. So that's the ROM I'm choosing in the software. OK, let's fire this up. When I connect the pager, it detects 3.3 volts coming in on one of the pins, putting it in programming mode. But when I try to connect, I keep getting timeout errors. I tried every possible combination to get this working. There's so many variables here. Could it be DOSBox or Windows 10 or my GPD laptop? After much research, I found that NEC uses inverted TTL serial to talk to their pages. And this was really confusing, because serial TTL is already inverted from RS-232 serial. But for an NEC pager, they mean you need an inverted inverted TTL signal. I realised I could use an FTDI USB to serial adapter. And these have software which you can use to invert the inverted signal. And once I did this, I was finally able to connect to the pager. And I can now read out the settings. And it tells me that the cap code on this pager is 0527612. There's also a ton of different settings in the configuration section. I'm not sure what most of them do, but this is really awesome. I'm going to make sure that I can also write new configurations to this pager. So first I'm going to change the cap code to something more memorable. In this case, 001337. And I'm going to write that into the EEPROM. And success, that seems to have worked. When I read the pager settings back, it seems to have taken the new cap code. OK, I'm really keen to try this with my HackRF now. I just need to set the new cap code and make sure the frequency is good. Everything looks OK and transmit. And there it goes. We've got a tone only message on the pager. So let's switch the HackRF from address only to alphanumeric mode and input a message using the on screen keyboard. And there it goes. My pager has finally gotten the message. Tell him Leonard Nemo I gave you the message. And it works in both beep and vibration mode. I would really like to change the frequency that these pages operate at, so I can use them legally. For example, the 148 MHz band that these use is very close to 151 MHz, which is a range that I can legally transmit on up to 100 milliwatts. 
but I need to find a replacement crystal to switch the frequency. I'm not sure how easy that would be to find. I also have this much more modern pager, probably from about the 2000s. In the menu, it even shows me the cap code that's been programmed in. Even better is the frequency this uses can be programmed from between 448 to 454 MHz. But despite being more modern, there seems to be even less information available for programming these. It looks very similar to AlphaPoc based pages, but I think this is a Geo based pager, and I don't even know what frequency this is currently set to. Messing about with these pages has also made me much more interested in modern messaging technologies, with one such network being MeshTastic, which uses LoRa radios. I love the idea of one day having a two way MeshTastic pager in my pocket. Something that looks like the old two-way based Motorola pages from the late 1990s. They can also act as a node, relaying other people's encrypted messages around the network as I carry it on me. I still have much more to learn about radio, and my HackRF is a great way to do this. There are some really interesting channels out there talking all about these topics, such as a new favourite called Snorin, with some excellent radio and HackRF based videos. Modern smartphones may have become boring slabs of lockdown, mediocre experiences, but I'm pleased to see that there are new devices and new gadgets appearing that are much more interesting and exciting to tinker with. I still have a lot of retro and vintage hardware that I want to explore though. If you find yourself watching future videos, consider one day helping out with support such as Super Thanks or Patreon. Your support is optional, but really appreciated. I want to keep these videos available for everyone. But that's it for now, and I'll see you next time.